Mr. Nyat Chung, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Professor Tan Tiam Soon, President of the University, distinguished guests, professors, students, ladies and gentlemen. Very glad to be here for the first SIT Dialogue with Citizens. You've chosen a very apt theme for this evening, preparing for the future economy, which focuses on two important questions. First, the future, what will it look like? And secondly, what can we do to prepare ourselves for it? To know how to prepare ourselves for the future, first we've got to understand where we are now, where do we stand? You are studying at SIT, preparing to start work at a moment when our economy is at a turning point. Entering a new phase in our development, where the jobs available, the skills in demand, are going to be are already different from what used to be and are continuing to change rapidly. Your working careers and your pathways in life will be very different from your parents' generation. You will experience more changes, your lives will be less predictable, but also, I believe, more varied and rewarding. So, confronted with these changes, it's quite natural for all of you, or many of you, to feel uncertain and to ask yourself, will there be a future for us? Or what will it look like? Fifty years ago, when Singapore became independent, our pioneers asked themselves the same question. Singapore had suddenly and unexpectedly become independent. Our old strategy was to prosper as part of the Federation of Malaysia, and that strategy had collapsed. We need a new strategy, and we thought about it, and we decided to open our economy to attract MNC foreign investments, to market to the world, make the world our market, and to make ourselves a first world country. And because that strategy succeeded brilliantly, that's why we are here today. Let's take one generation as 30 years. It may seem a long time to some of you, but actually 30 years is not very long. Let's look back 30 years and see how Singapore has changed. 30 years ago, your parents were about your age. On every count, our lives today are better than our lives a generation ago. Per capita GDP in 30 years has gone up three times in real terms. We are healthier, we are living much longer. Life expectancy has gone up. Now, in Singapore, it's 83. It's one of the longest life expectancies in the world. Our housing has improved. Our public transportation has got better too. You, you may smile, but it is true, and we are going to make it get even better. <laughs> Especially with the help of some of your sustainable engineers. <laughs> so if you look forward another 30 years to your children's generation, what do you expect? The world will be different. Things will not stand still. And if Singapore is still the same 30 years from now as it is today, we are in trouble. You, must, you will expect to see breakthroughs in technology, driverless cars, renewable energy, personalized medicine, artificial intelligence, and more things not yet dreamt of, which will affect all aspects of our lives, how we work, how we play, how we live, how we communicate, how we come together as a society. And I think if you take a 30-year time frame, I would say despite all the current difficulties in the world economy, 30 years from now, the leading cities in the world, New York, London, Berlin, Shanghai, Sydney, they will continue to be vibrant, prosperous hubs of opportunities, where there's innovation, where there's culture, where there's influence. And 
30 years from now, there's no reason why Singapore should not be in that same class. And we have every reason to be on that list. Why? Because we are highly connected, we are tech-savvy, we've earned a reputation as an outstanding place to do business. Where company, when companies look around the world to choose a place to invest, to set up a headquarters, to build a plant, Singapore is often on the short list. We are creating many jobs, more than will replace the ones which we may well lose as the economy changes. We are continuing to invest in our people through a very good education system. And we are investing in people who are hardworking and talented. When our students go overseas on exchange programs or competitions, we realize that actually Singaporeans, not bad after all. You can go many places and you can compare yourselves to your peers, students in other countries, top universities, and you know that you're not inferior to them. You can hold your own, be proud of yourself, and people get to know us, have a regard for us. When we compete in international competitions, we do well. World skills competition, we regularly come home with medals. International Olympiads, physics, IT, biology, mathematics, chemistry, we often come back with medals. Small country, little red dot, but a lot of firepower. All in all, if there's any city in the world which is well placed to do well in the new world economy, Singapore should be that place. Right now, we are experiencing some difficult economic conditions. Growth is slow all over the region, in fact, in many countries in the world. Our exports are flat. We are feeling the pain of restructuring, but not yet seeing the dividends of our hard work. But we are pursuing all the right strategies, and I'm confident that given time, these strategies will work for us. You compare yourself with your parents' generation. You've got the benefit of that 30 years of hard work. You're at a higher base, and you are poised to take Singapore further forward. We can continue to grow our economy, to raise our incomes, to improve all our lives. It won't be as fast as we did over the last 30 years when we were making 7% per year on average, year after year. But it will be as fast as other developed economies. 2-3% to a year if we work smart and work hard. And more than that, we are in a position to make Singapore an endearing and fulfilling home. Because many of you have dreams which go beyond just climbing the corporate ladder or earning more money. You want to contribute to the community, you want to care for the environment, or you want to master a skill or an art or a sport that you're passionate about. And all those are part of what makes Singapore tick and must be part of Singapore's future. So ultimately, how well Singapore does and what kind of society we will be a generation from now depends on you, on the next generation of Singaporeans. Whether you make the most of the opportunities you will have, whether you're resilient in the face of uncertainty and change, whether your generation works together as one united people, just like your parents' generation and their parents' generation did. You are our hopes for the future. And we have invested in you and we've given young, or we've created for young Singaporeans today many more opportunities than your parents ever had. 30 years ago, our education system was not like it is today. At that time, just 5% of students entered university and another 5% of students had the chance to go to polytechnic. Total tertiary education, 10%. Today, education opportunities have opened up tremendously. In your cohort, 
One third, almost, go to university, 32%. Nearly another half go to the polytechnic, 47%. And the rest, most, get a place in the ITE and a chance to move up beyond the ITE. You have so many more options and pathways. The ITE and the diploma courses prepare you for new jobs which are available. There are new courses of study, including cross-disciplinary programs that train you in workplace skills that are in demand. And you have the opportunity to cross over. You may go one way, but you may change your mind. You do well, you can cross over. You can go from ITE to poly. You can go from poly to university. Even in university, the options are more flexible and open. And I think many of you have come that route, many from the poly and I think some from the ITE too. And so the education opportunities have opened up, but it's not just school, it's also making sure that you not, you, having earned a good certificate or diploma, you have skills and you have know-how which you can put to use and which will help you get a good job and achieve your aspirations. To create more university places, to produce more graduates, print more degrees, is not so hard. Costs a lot of money, but it's not so hard. You can do it. The difficult thing is to train people and to build the economy at the same time in such a way that after you graduate, having done something which you want to do, there's a job which is available, which will match your aspirations and what we have invested in you. And that's much harder because you have to create the jobs and you have to meet the expectations. And sometimes we have to manage the expectations and say, well, you can't get exactly what you want, but you get something like what you want. And other countries struggle with this problem too. Many European countries which have proliferated graduates have found that they can't find jobs for them and are now trying to tighten up. In Asia, if you look at South Korea, you look at Taiwan, nearly everybody has a degree of some kind. Nearly everybody. But many graduates cannot find jobs to match their degrees. And youth unemployment is a serious problem. And that's why in Singapore, the government has established universities, education institutions with applied pathways, leading to qualifications which are relevant to the industry. So the polys and universities, particularly SIT and UNISIM, are very good examples of that. And that means the opportunities are there to get the degree first, or at least a good qualification, and ultimately a job, a career, and a bright future. And that's why in Singapore we don't have a youth unemployment problem, unique amongst many of the developed countries. We are also creating opportunities for Singaporeans by connecting with the world. For years, we've been invest in, in inviting MNCs to invest in Singapore. And today, we are still doing that, but we are doing much more. Whenever I travel, one item on my agenda is almost always the economy and jobs. How to create opportunities for Singaporeans by using our network, by building our reputation by developing our linkages. Creating opportunities in Singapore, but also overseas for Singaporeans to work abroad, for our companies to go abroad in the world, in the region. Recently, you may have noticed I've been on the road a lot. I've made a series of overseas trips. Every time, every one of those trips has had an economic component to it. In China, I visited Chongqing. Chongqing is where we have a G2G project with the Chongqing city government focused on modern logistics and connectivity. So our companies can go there, operate there, link up Chongqing with the world. At the same time, link up not just in terms of logistics and physical transport, but also financial services. So linking up Chongqing with Singapore. For example, for, financial for, for companies in Chongqing, when they need to raise renminbi, they are able to do so in Singapore, and therefore there's business for our banks. 
there are jobs in the financial sector for Singaporeans. I went to Japan. I met CEOs of Japanese multinationals. Every time I go to Japan, I do that. We know many of them because a lot of the Japanese MNCs have been in Singapore a long time. Uh, all the big Japanese MNCs are here. They are either clients of EDB or they are clients of IE Singapore, like the trading companies, Maru Beni, or the banks, BOTM, the others, Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi, encouraged to build up their business here by MAS. So when I'm in Japan, I meet them. And they tell me how they feel about the Japanese economy. They tell me how they feel about Singapore and the region, Southeast Asia. They ask me what we are doing about the region. And they share with me their plans. And I encourage them to do more. And I'm happy to tell you this time, they were satisfied with what's happening in Singapore with their businesses here and quite keen to expand their businesses in Singapore. And I encourage them to do more. I went to India. In India, Prime Minister Narendra Modi talks about 100 smart cities. Singapore, we are building one. In India, they have 100. He asked what we can do to work with them. We said 100 is beyond our, scape, our, our scope our scale, but one or two, one by one, we can do. And we're doing one of them. In Andhra Pradesh, they are building a new capital from scratch, Greenfield. It's called Amaravati, and they ask, they ask us to do the master plan. We did the master plan. Now they are tendering out the master developer, and Singapore company is bidding we are hopeful that we can get the contract to be the master developer. That's a very big project for us. Why is it there is this link? Because we have been cultivating the relationship for a very long time. The chief minister is Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu. You may not have heard of him, but he is a very capable man. He was chief minister more than 10 years ago. The last time I was in uh, Hyderabad, in Andhra Pradesh, I met him and talked to him. This was about 2004. After that, he lost the elections. It happens, you know, when you're in politics. <laughs> we kept in touch with him. We invited him here, we engaged. He knows us, we know him. Last election, he came back in. His party won. He is now building a new capital because the state split into two, and the old capital is being given to the new state of Telangana, and he is going to old state of Andhra Pradesh is going to build a new capital in Amaravati, and he's asked us to master plan, and now we are bidding to be the master developer. Business, how do you get it? Developing the connections, building up our reputation, and then delivering. We get it. Then I went to Australia. What did we do there? We signed an upgrade of the Singapore-Australia Free Trade Agreement, S-A-F-T-A, SAFTA. It does many things, but one of the things it does is to make it easier for Singaporean professionals and entrepreneurs to go to Australia to work, and Australian professionals and entrepreneurs to come to Singapore to work. It's a reciprocal ag arrangement, works both ways, but it means opportunities for Singaporeans to go to take advantage of the opportunities there. And beyond that, the Australians are setting up a landing pad here. A landing pad meaning a startup place for promising Australian companies to come to Singapore to set up, to use Singapore as a base to do business in the region. And if they can use Singapore as a launch pad, then there's business opportunities for Singaporeans. They'll hire Singaporeans, they'll have business locally. It's good for us. So everywhere we go, we see partners who want to link up with us in Singapore. And the more we can have these networks, I think the more opportunities Singaporeans will have. So as young Singaporeans, the world is your oyster. 
You have many opportunities, many more than your parents had. Some of you wish you had been born in your parents' generation. I think many of our parents wish they were born in your generation. Because the chances are all there. You have to seize them, make the most of them, and then you have to create more opportunities for yourself. And to do that, you have to be resilient. You know the world is changing. You can't predict how, you can't predict when. But you have to gird yourself for what might happen, whatever might happen, and adapt to new conditions as they come up. And from time to time, we are bound to encounter downturns and setbacks. And we've got to take them in our stride, have the toughness and flexibility to soldier on and see them through. It's always been like that. Today, from where we are, if you look back 50 years, steadily it looks like riding an escalator. Up. Smooth, upward, inevitable. But actually, at the time, if you were making the climb, as your parents did and your grandparents, it was not so inevitable, it was not so easy. There were difficult and uncertain moments when we left Malaysia, when the British forces left Singapore, when the global economy ran into trouble, oil shocks, global recessions, high inflation, no growth. We were affected each time you are buffeted up and down. Our security, our progress were threatened, and we could easily have run into trouble. But we persevered. We went on. It didn't mean that we were sure we would get there, but we were determined to get there. And we pressed on, we adapted to the new conditions. Eventually, we got there. We haven't arrived, but we made progress. And so it's going to be with your generation. Move forward steadily, resolutely, resourcefully. You've got to have it in you. Things happen, yes, we will take it in our stride, we will respond. We are not made of candy floss, or as the Taiwanese say, we are not chao mei zu. You know what's chao mei zu? Strawberry generation. Or we are not like that. But these are durians, very tough. <laughs> One major uncertainty which we know is there, if you look ahead, is the economy. The technology is progressing. On the production line, robots are replacing jobs. In the professions, AI is replacing or working with people, artificial intelligence. Many industries will be transformed. Many jobs will be changed or maybe made redundant. Today, taxi companies and drivers worry about Uber and Grab. But actually, Uber and Grab is not the most frightening tiger in the forest because there are already people trying out driverless taxis, driverless buses, and a completely different kind of service, a completely different way of planning for urban transportation. And we have to go with that. You can say, don't allow people to drive Uber cars. When a driverless car comes, can we say, every car must have a driver sitting inside? It's like saying every lift must have a lift operator sitting inside. Once upon a time, it was like that. Ten years from now, it will not be the same. So, but we know that, but then which new industries are going to come? Which old jobs will fade away? Which fresh skills are going to be in demand? Nobody can predict for sure, but surely, in the next 40 years, 30 years of your working life, and you will be working for longer than the next 30 years, you will see many changes and be affected by quite a number of them. One of the things which will help you to cope with this is skills future, which will make learning and adapting a lifelong endeavor. Our police and our ITEs are uh, enhancing enhanced, are uh, implementing enhanced internships and earn and learn programs. 
covering many sectors, aerospace, construction, logistics, maritime, visual comms, healthcare, so that after graduation you can build on what you have learned, the skills and knowledge which you have, and transition more smoothly into the workforce and keep on learning while you are there. And the universities and polis are also going on to cater to the needs for you to keep on learning after you have started working. Setting up units focused on lifelong learning, like the initiative by NTUC and NTU, the collaboration which they announced earlier this year. So the scaffolding there is there, the support structure is there, it's up to you. Take it, use it, make the most of it. You need the resolve and the spirit to take up the schemes, to switch jobs, to move to a different industry, to learn and unlearn and relearn things all of your life. <laughs> I've talked about opportunities and resilience. These focus more on the individual. But, and indeed, your individual commitment and contributions are important to Singapore because each one of us must try our best in order for Singapore to have a best overall performance. But our real strength is that we are united as a society. We work together. Not just working hard, but working together. And this is the secret of why we've succeeded all these years. Each one of our pioneers contributed their skills and their efforts but they were so much stronger because together they worked as a team and transformed Singapore from a village into a metropolis. Berry, the Business Environment and Risk Information Assessing Outfit, BERI, they have ranked the workforces in all the countries in the world and for many, many years, decades, Singapore has had the best workforce in the world. Why is that? Our people are hard, work hard, they're smart, they're well-trained. But the, we may not individually be the fastest or the smartest in the world. But we work together. Our unions, our managements, companies, our government work together. We have a tripartite relationship. We adopt a win-win mindset. When things come up, we tackle them cooperatively and there's give and take on all sides. And we remember that however important is the thing we are arguing over, the most important thing for us is that we have a relationship, we have the trust, and that has to hold over many, many issues. So you give and take on this issue because you fully expect that the next time there will also be give and take on new issues which will come up. And that is the secret of Singapore. People come and ask, what is your secret? How is it you can do this? The answer is, well, in a way it's a big secret, in another way it's not a secret. It's not a secret because I can tell you, but it's a big secret because it doesn't mean you can do what I tell you we are doing. And that is to be able to work together. When I go overseas and meet Singaporeans, it's always a warm feeling whether I meet somebody at random on the street and he hails me, hello, Mr. Lee, or whether it's a gathering of Singaporeans in Ulaanbaatar, in Mongolia, or in Canberra, or in Tokyo. It's a warm feeling because we have a mutual sense of recognition, of camaraderie, kinship, solidarity. We feel that something draws us together. But this unity is not just a warm feeling, it's really the bedrock of the society. And we must not forget it or take it for granted as we build our home here in Singapore. SIT here epitomizes what I talked about. Creating opportunities, having a resilient spirit, being a united people. I'm making this speech in SIT not because I'm telling you what SIT's audience would like to hear because I chose this place to make the speech which I wanted to make at an audience for whom this is the most directly relevant. Because actually this is the way Singapore works 
and SIT is an epitome of the way Singapore succeeds and has to succeed. SIT offers students the chance to develop yourselves through many different pathways, to explore a wide range of opportunities. Some of you worked at, for some time, different careers before coming to SIT. Hari Ram worked for nine years in the prison service, now pursuing a degree in criminology and security. Or Adeline Tech, an occupational therapist, 20 years before she came to SIT to upgrade. Many of you who have not worked before have also upgraded yourselves, some from the poly, others from the ITE to the poly, from the poly all the way up to university. Finding opportunities which suit your aptitudes, approaching life with a can-do spirit, making a future for yourselves. When I visited you last January, I met some of you, and I asked how they're doing, and I'm glad that since then, nearly a year, they are progressing. One of them, Felicia Yeo, has just started her career in accounting, already found a job. Another one, Tanku Muhammad Khalaf, now doing his one-year IWSP placement at SMRT, Integrated Work Study Program. And I'm sure many of the others are also doing well. Because SIT trains you in skills which are in demand and will help you to find good jobs. Skills like sustainable infrastructure engineering, systems engineering, or telematics which are important jobs given what we are building in Singapore. The infrastructure we are building, trains, airports, smart city. So many engineering projects needing good engineers not just to build them, but to operate them, maintain them, upgrade them, keep them up to scratch so that, uh, that, so that we are world class. The Japanese are very good at this. Their trains work, their airports work, their buildings are well maintained. We can be just as good as that. In health sciences, we need many professionals, nursing, OT, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, diagnostic, radiography. The population is aging. We are building new hospitals, new community hospitals, new nursing homes. They all need to be staffed, and we need many more such professionals. We bring in foreign staff because we don't have enough of our own, but we must have some of our own, a core of our own, to run the system so that we can build it, so that Singapore can be special and have that special character of Singapore. SIT takes a practical approach to learning, like the IWSP. Immerse the students in a work environment during placement stints, Apply at the workplace what you have learned in class. And the program brings the industry to the school and the school to the industry. And it's a long attachment, eight months, a year. At the end of it, you know the company, the company knows you. And if you are, you've hit it off, they may offer you a job. And they often do. We are seeing results. SIT students quickly find jobs upon graduation. In fact, within six months, 90% find jobs. And the accountancy students who often go for the IWSP, 80% of them have also received, have already received priority job offers even before graduating, which must mean they have confidence in you, they haven't seen your final exam results, <laughs> but they know the quality of the person. Please don't disappoint them in your final exam. We are also helping our students to get a sense of the world, to go overseas, build up your exposure and experience. We have an enterprise immersion program. We send students to Suzhou, to Beijing, to Kanazawa in Japan, to Moscow, where you have opportunities to interact with entrepreneurs, to so in the mood to be caught by the bug or to catch the bug and to feel that you want to start something. Yesterday, Sunday Times had an article about cybersecurity cyber professionals in Singapore and how the demand for them is going up. It's a growth industry because countries and businesses are getting more connected. Singapore is already highly connected. We want to be a smart nation. We all depend on systems. 
whether it's your handphone, whether it's your home computer, whether it's your office computer, or whether it's connecting to the government in order to renew a passport or to apply for an exit permit. System down, all work stops. We have to make sure that system is secure, no bad hats come along, DDDO, DDoS, and shut us down, which people have tried. So we've been building career pathways for cybersecurity uh, professionals. We have degree programs in cybersecurity, including in SIT. I hope there are some cybersecurity white hats here. Are there? Nobody put hands up. <laughs> I'm sure you must be somewhere around. And EDB offers fresh graduates attachment programs with companies overseas. So the Sunday Times article featured five graduates on a one-year program with Kaspersky Lab. Kaspersky is a, one of the big uh, computer security companies, Russian company. The headquarters is in Moscow. And these five stu students, actually new graduates, were at Kaspersky's global headquarters, analyzing malware, documenting new types of computer viruses, searching for threats which come through web browsers. There were five graduates on this program. One was from NTU, and the other four, you'll be very happy to hear, came from SIT, their citizens. So one of them was quoted as saying, if I never left Singapore, I probably would have stuck with normal computer programming and wouldn't have stepped into cybersecurity and found my interest. His limb win-win, and he graduated from SIT last year. So it's an example of how we are creating opportunities, exposing you to the world, developing your resilience in an open education system, and how people are actually going for it and seizing the opportunities. But the SIT experience is not just about academic requirements and jobs. It's also a bonding experience to get to know one another, to work with one another, to form friendships and networks which will last a working career and perhaps a lifetime. I'm glad that despite your full schedules, you find time to come together to give back to community helping spring clean homes for the elderly, raising funds for the President's Challenge, using IT skills to design apps and programs to benefit the community. It's an involvement which links you back to the society which nurtured you, which you belong to, which enabled you to come to university, enjoy the opportunities, study in SIT, and do well. That's what it means to be a citizen of Singapore. Because SIT is successful, so we are investing more in it. Building a new campus in Pongo to bring together all of SIT's activities in one place, one place offering outstanding facilities and the opportunity to grow further. And we're going to integrate SIT Pongo with the surrounding industrial space and the public park, so that you're part of Pongo. You're not just a university by itself, but you're in Pongo and connected to other things in Pongo. And this will enhance the applied learning curriculum of the university, as well as your contribution to this community. Launchpad at Block 71 taught us something. We started it. We built it as an incubator for startups. It's not very far from here, so you must know about it. And it became so successful that it has organically grown to become part of NUS and created a buzz in the whole Ayaraja area. As we would like to say we purposely did it like that, but honestly, we just built it and we were very happy to see it happen. <laughs> but in Pongol, we will purposely do it like that. So in Pongol, we've planned the integration for SIT because there will be tech park nearby, there will be industry opportunities for attachments, for connections, for research for working together. And SIT Pongol will strengthen your identity, give you a mothership to return to, to learn new skills, or to contribute and to give back. 
as your president says, once a citizen, always a citizen. So we come back to the question that young people ask, will there be a future for us? And the answer is, yes, there will, provided you work at it, not just individually, but together, not just for yourself, but for one another and for Singapore. One evening recently, a beautiful double rainbow appeared in the skies seen from many parts of Singapore. Unfortunately, I was nose to the grindstone in my office and missed seeing the rainbow. But somebody alerted me over Facebook. <laughs> so I posted his picture and I invited people who looked at my page to share their pictures as well. And within a very short while, my page was flooded with beautiful photos and heartwarming messages. And the rainbow reminds us that rainy days are not always gloomy and will not always be gloomy. They too have their share of happy surprises. So please remember this as you chase your own rainbows through life. 20 years ago, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew spoke to a university audience and urged the students to chase the rainbow. He was speaking to that generation of young people. This 20 years ago, so a bit younger than your parents. And they were asking the same question as you, what is the future for us? And Mr. Lee urged them to go for it, to chase that rainbow with the same passion that he himself had pursued his goals as a young man. Actually, he pursued his goals with passion into old age. <laughs> but he said, go for it. The opportunities are there, and you will find something if you chase it. And they did. So today, Singapore has progressed and is still doing well. But Mr. Lee's message wasn't just for them, that generation. It's a timeless message relevant to each new generation. Now, it's your turn. You will encounter challenges, rainy days, sometimes even thunderstorms. But if you press on through the storms and the rain, the skies will eventually clear. And then if you work hard to get yourself into the right place, you will find your rainbow. So be confident, aim high, and do well. And a generation from now, you will have built Singapore into something much better, something beyond what our imagination can dream of today. And then you can say, we've done our duty. Thank you very much.